um, to speak about resilience, which is something I'm really passionate about because resilience where does it come from we don't really know sometimes you know scientists think it come it can come from our genes it's a genetic predisposition or that it comes from our experiences but certainly i know a lot of my own resilience has come through my experiences in leadership career challenges learning to bounce back which is what resilience is and has really helped me with the business that i run now in terms of coaching and development and helping managers step up to that position of leadership which is a big shift for a lot of people. So what I'm gonna to do today is cover three key areas and I'm gonna cover what resilience is, why do we need it, how to find it and how to keep it. So those sort of three, three large areas there and throughout the presentation, I'm gonna give you some actionable tips and steps you can look at today, either for yourself personally, or if you're running a team, there might be things that you can explore in your one-to-one -one conversations with your team or employees. So let's get going. I will say that clenching is not, an, you know, is not obligatory. So um, thanks for Laura for that amazing tip. I've never heard that before. So it's, it's really up to you if you clench or not. So let's get going. Let me just move the slide on. Okay, so let's look at a definition of what is resilience. So the resilience, if you think of it, is like a rubber, an elastic band. So we have times in our life that times in our life that really, really, really stretch us. And if you think we pull a rubber band too far, it's going to snap. But resilience is about that ability of bouncing back or springing back. It's about elasticity, the power to sort of not be unaffected by what happens to us, but resume our original shape, you know, or redefine ourselves and be flexible to the, the, the events in life, life that happens to us. Because there's much we can influence in our life, but what we can influence is ourself, how we deal with obstacles, how we deal with things that happen in our lives. We can control certain things to an element. We can maybe control, you know, our habits and uh, how we go about our daily activities. But really, we can't control or influence the outside world. So we need to let go of that. And I think this year or the last year has shown that in abundance, just how much we've possibly expected to do things, taking things for granted and resilience is such a key skill and there's so many stories of resilience that's happened during the pandemic so it's been a really valuable lesson for us over the last year or so and I'm sure some of you have encountered experiences in your career where it's really stretched you like that rubber band but hopefully you've bounced back sometimes the stress feels a bit too much and where that band can snap and I'll come on to that a bit later so why do we need resilience? So I'm going to discuss this from the concept of positive psychology. Now, positive psychology is about the science of happiness. But more than that, it's about it's actually about resilience because it's been demonstrated that resilience is one of the most important skill sets we need to have in life. And I've got a really interesting quote that I kind of invented myself that will illustrate that at the end of the presentation. It's about the ability to bounce back because let's face it, things are going to happen. You know, in your industry, I'm sure you see it all the time. And perhaps you need uh, sometimes an instant resilience or after a medium term resilience to analyse, well, what happened there? How can we prevent it? What can we do? So resilience is very, very much linked to having that open questioning mindset, which I'm sure you use in abundance in your industry to not run away from things, to bury our heads in the sand, but to really think about how can we overcome a crisis, a situation. And resilience is important because it allows us to process what happens to us. It means that crises, mistakes, events don't determine who we are as a person, who we are as an executive. And it means that we find healthy coping mechanisms to what happens to us. We, if we are resilient, we tap into our support systems. We tap into our strengths to think about how we can overcome challenges. So one of the first things you can do if you feel that your resilience is a bit lacking is really take a skills audit. Take a skills audit and understand, do you know what? These are my key strengths. 
Another tool that I use in my coaching is disc profiling, which is psychometric profiling. There's lots of these tools in existence. I'm sure you've seen them yourself. You know, it might be Myers-Briggs, it might be Insights. I'd really recommend for your team um, actually undertaking some of those, those psychometric profiling tests because it demonstrates how we show up to work and it uses an algorithm. So it works off, you know, it's, it's derived from ancient psychology, but it works off an algorithm. And it looks at how you, you answer different questions. Do you answer in the same way or a different way? And it gives you a fantastic report that tells you, this is how I show up at work. This is what happens when I'm under stress. Because when we're under stress, we tend to exaggerate certain aspects of our personality. We exaggerate our strengths and that can lead us to exhaustion. And that's where resilience can break down. If the stress is too much, we're not coping, the resilience and the ability to deal with what happens to us breaks down. So I'd really recommend looking at that because it also gives you tips on how to cope, how to uh, sort of address the things that you're afraid of. So it really gives you a good um, analysis of your skills because we want to build on those skills, but not overuse them when we're under under you know in a crisis situation or something difficult so why do we need it i've given you a whole list of reasons there in terms of how you can improve and empower your team and your executives to move forward and learn because i don't know about you but i know that in my own life you know it's easy to be positive it's easy to be resilient when everything is going well but actually it's when things are not going quite as well that I feel those are the real areas of growth because they really test us. They push us out of our comfort zones, whether that's in your career, your leadership, whatever it is, any relationships you're having in your life, that is where we stretch and grow. And that's the beauty of growing your resilience and facing these situations with that open mindset, that questioning mindset that allows us to grow rather than being very fixed in our mindset and saying, do you know what? Well, I just don't know how to do it. I'm going to give up. And there's been all sorts of experiments on mindset, which is very, very closely linked to this subject of resilience to demonstrate that when people used a fixed mindset to define, to solve a puzzle, they actually grew and their own self-satisfaction and happiness grew rather than those groups of people that decided, you know what, I give up, I, you know, I don't have the answer, I'm whatever, you know, they gave up. And that led to them feeling quite disempowered. So there is actually evidence around this. And as I talk about in positive psychology, resilience, you know, is that number one key skill set we need in life. Because, you know, if we're trying to do something new, if we're trying to, you know, get into a new role, if we're trying to develop our team, it requires us to do something different. So we're not going to know all the answers. So resilience really helps us to cope with that stress, any resistance in our lives. It helps us deal with setbacks, failures, when things don't go according to plan. It helps your team get back on track, learn, <clears throat> find a way to keep going towards your goals. And it helps you deal with situations that can impact on team performance. And we know when a team's not performing, that leads to a loss of results and possibly people leaving the organisation, which has a finan financial correlation. So there's lots of reasons why resilience is really important. So lots of reasons there and managing negative emotions to experience more positive emotions. Now, if those reasons weren't enough, it's also been shown that developing a resilient mindset is also uh, helps with successful aging and a sense of well-being as you get older. So it's a good anti-aging uh, mechanism as well. So that, that tips for free folks, it really helps with successful aging, healthy aging. These two look quite happy, I'm sure they're quite resilient. Anyway, so as I mentioned at the beginning, where does resilience come from? There's lots and lots of different schools of thought. It can be uh, that we're born with resilience, that we just have the resilience genes, or that it's developed through experience or relationships over time. It can be both. It can be both. The important thing is you can learn resilience. And that's where mentoring, coaching, training, speaking to your role models, people that you look up to, to ask them their advice can really, really help 
it's not fixed because I know with the people that I've worked with, they've suddenly gone from being buried in their problems to now thinking, right, I'm not running away from the fact this is difficult, but how do I solve it? It's the how question. And I know from my own personal experience, the more that I've stretched myself and gone through various challenges, the more that I've grown. And the areas that used to bother me years ago, I, I sort of glide through them now. I've got a whole different set of problems. You know, as we progress, we have a whole different set of problems, which sometimes is a sign of development. So it can be both. So it's, perhaps it's worth looking at for your own development and your development as a leader. You know, how does your family cope with setbacks? What did you learn about dealing with setbacks when you were growing up? Do you think you inherited a fixed mindset or an open mindset? What was some of the language that was used with your families? You know, what were the behaviours in your family? Because if you can start to identify those, and that's not to blame your family at all, but it's worth looking in the rearview mirror to understand, well, what was my support system like growing up? What's it been like through my career? What have I learned through those different interactions? And what can I now do to develop a good self-image and a positive attitude? You know, and how can I make a plan for anything that comes up in my life. So it can be a result of past experiences. So this isn't about blaming ourselves or blaming anyone else. It's just about taking a realistic stop check, if you like, to understand, well, hang on a minute, what did I do well then? What didn't I do well? What could I do differently? What questions didn't I ask? You know, what happened in my family when things went wrong? What were some of the beliefs that I heard? Life is hard, life is difficult. You know, some people have it lucky. Go back and sort of think of some of those questions. Now, stress can really undermine resilience. And I've got a really nice graphic later on in the slide deck that stress, the stress versus pressure, um, a bit of pressure, as I'm sure you all know in the roles that you do. I don't know about you. For me, I actually find that quite empowering. I can feel like I'm quite in the flow. And now diff people have different levels of tolerations to stress and pressure, pressure, for example. A bit of pressure can be fine. It can be motivating. But stress is sometimes when we don't like what we're doing or we have too much pressure and we can't cope. And I don't know whether you've had that feeling. You know, something happens in our brain between the left, uh, the left side of our brain which does the kind of more analytical processing and the creative right side of our brain. We've all, got, we've all got a bit of both, left or right brained. What happens when we're incredibly stressed is those, those two parts of our brain just stop working. They stop, it's like a short circuit. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever had that feeling of, uh, I don't know what to do. Um, I can't remember what I was doing half an hour ago. That's, that's a sign of a bit of stress there because the two parts of our brain they're just trying to work together to deal with all this stress and they just can't do it. They just can't do it. So you just need to step away, you know, think, you know, plan, you know, I'll come on to the tips in a minute and think about how you can get your brain working a bit more effectively. And we've got the amygdala as well, which is the emotional hub of the brain. And it sets off a chemical reaction and it doesn't take long for that information to get to our brain that, oh, I'm stressed. Hang on a minute. There is that chemical reaction that happens. Um, so our all the different parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is about information processing, just gets flooded. So the brain gets flooded. So if you've ever felt like that, don't worry. You know, it's just that you might want to think about taking a step back, that you might be overloaded, a bit stressed rather than just under a bit of pressure. And it can have an impact on resilience. You know, when I'm coaching, um, and again, going back to the disc profiling, actually, if you know what your 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 style is at work, what your work behaviours are and how you act under stress, you can mitigate that. If you mitigate the stress or almost plan for it, understand what stresses you, how you react, then you can sort of almost start to think about well, what would I do in this situation? Or if it starts happening, it's something that's familiar, familiar to you. You understand what it is. So that takes away some of its power. So you can um, use psychometric profiling tools to do that, to help manage that, that stress and not feel so hijacked. The other thing you can do is mindfulness. You know, I don't know whether you practice mindfulness. It's becoming more and more accepted in business now. And literally, even if it's just stop, take a deep breath, walk away from your desk, 
get some fresh air, change of scene, and just switch off for a bit. Because I think, especially working at home, the danger is, is that we fill the hours that we used to be commuting. You know, we might be commuting, listening to music or reading a book. Sometimes we can fill those hours or other people do that for us. And so it's really important to take the breaks, step away from the screen and take a mindful moment to stop, breathe, relax, picture something pleasant. That's one of the sort of more immediate things you can do to manage that. So here's some more tips for you, you know, in terms of questions you can ask yourself in your business context, in your leadership context, and for yourself, actually. And maybe, you know, I don't know how you work with your teams. I'm hoping that you have pretty robust one-to-ones with your team. But really think about what are you telling yourself? Can you coach one of your team members around some of these questions? You know, are you triggering a fear that's impacting your resilience? Is your perception of the situation correct or are you replaying old events into the current situation you're projecting from the past? One thing you can do as well is keep a stress log. So I know that sounds a bit bizarre, but actually write down or keep in a document somewhere, when do I feel stressed? You know, what, what are the impacts on stress? Is it, do I get physical pain and emotional pain? Psychologically, is there something going on? Am I saying things to myself that aren't healthy? Am I behaving in a very different way? So keep um, an audit of those different parameters and understand, well, what are the signs? What are the danger signs that I'm getting near to stress? Because when we're, we're in that stress mode, it just, it knocks out resilience. And this is something that you may be able to coach your teams on. And again, if you've got the psychometric profiling results, that can really help as well, because how you interact with your teams is going to be different for each employee, depending on their psychometric profile, how they like to be managed, their level of experience. So it's not a one size fits all. So I'd get familiar with your team and maybe help them through some of these questions. And what's the worst that can happen is a really good question that we can ask ourselves. So this is the um, stress arc I was talking about that, you know, on the left hand side, you've got the pressure there that um, there's some healthy pressure there. And then we get to peak performance, you know, actually, you know, moving away from being unaware, bored, et cetera, to motivated, interested, energetic, whatever words you choose to use when you're in the flow, we get to that peak performance piece. But if we tip too much the other way, you might be familiar with some of those words that denote, oh, I'm stressed here. And again, just reflecting on what's going on at the moment, particularly, but in general, what can we control? What can we influence? There are so many external factors in the world, as we know, that we cannot control or influence. What decisions can we make? What decisions can we influence? Now, I use a term called inside out leadership, which is about really mastering yourself, mastering yourself as a leader, understanding yourself, how you show up at work and thinking about what kind of team player do I want to be? What kind of leader do I want to be? And leading with the front foot because our feet face forwards, they don't face backwards. So let's move forwards and really understand, okay, what's going on with me? Asking some of those questions that we asked before, because if you develop your own self-knowledge, your own self-leadership, your own self-mastery, you're going to be a better team member. You're going to be a much more accomplished leader and to be able to help other people, which I'm hoping you would want to do if you are leading a team. But again, there's external factors we can't influence, that we can't control. So we have to think about within, you know, you can draw circles on a page. What can I influence? What can I control? But I, I like them to use the word master. Uh, that's just me. Um, and think about what you can influence, what you can't, what you have to leave behind. There's a lot more that we can influence than we think. You know, I've been coaching people throughout the pandemic on their careers and their leadership piece. And it's like, OK, well, maybe this goal isn't going to look like this this year. But how could you do that in a different way? And, you know, really looking at that problem solving piece, which is all about resilience, you know, not giving up. And many, many people that I've coached in certain industries have done really, really well. They've discovered opportunities because they've opened their mindset and asked the right questions, such as some of the questions that I asked before. So, you know, there are opportunities there. If you just open up your thinking, you'll see opportunities there to become a better leader, a team player, etc. And realise 
you know what actually the thing I can influence is you know and control is myself you know so if you start with yourself then you can move forward and start influencing other people and there's a really good question around stress here around what's urgent what's important and I have got a matrix a tool if anybody wants a tool to help them decide what is urgent what's what's important then let me know and I can share that with you so again important urgent now I see this all the time with um managers that are stepping up into leadership because it's a tricky transition for people and that's where resilience can dip so I really get them to look at hang on a minute what part of your old job do you need to leave behind because they tip into overwhelm and it affects their resilience it affects their ability to lead because they're trying to do the old job and the new job so we do an exercise around what's important what's urgent what's important and not urgent and I've given you some examples there of how you can triage different things that are going on in your role, learning to delegate, that's critical, you know, in terms of being able to manage your own personal capacity to bounce back from stress, things that happen, you know, and, and maybe you can align a ranking to different activities that you're looking at in terms of gold, silver and bronze, bronze and create your own grid, you know, do you need to do something now? And does what I'm about to decide to do or do, does it take me to my goals and my values? the goals and values of the team. So this is a really, really, I'm sharing this with you because it's something that comes up in every meeting, really, every coaching session where people are overwhelmed and they can't problem solve. And it's like, look, to move forward, you have to leave certain things behind and sometimes you have to delegate. So I'd really urge you to think about how you triage different activities. Other things you can do, and these, you know, if we get a handle on some of these areas, it gives us more time for problem solving. And if you're leading a team to spend time with your team, getting to know them and helping building their resilience. Where are you wasting time? We all do it. We all do it in our personal lives. You know, is it, well, I'll just watch one more episode of this box set. Or is it, do you know what? I'll just spend a bit of time on social media. Um, is it, you know, I spend... Am I being a perfectionist? So everything I do has to be 110% perfect and 80, 20 is not gonna cut it. I see that a lot actually with people in terms of wanting everything to be perfect. Whereas sometimes the 80, 20 rule is good enough, especially if you're in a position of leadership where you've got more responsibilities, you know, moving away from sometimes the task-based activities to that responsibility that you have for yourself and other people in the team. So where are those hidden time wasters? Write them down, understand where they're coming from. Knowledge is power, as they say. And I, I do it all the time because my working week, my working arrangements can change quite swiftly. So I do it on a regular basis. I look at, well, what hours do I have during the day? What's coming up? Where do I need to focus? So how do I schedule my time? Think about what's really getting in the way. You know, is it, um, do you feel like you, you, you like to feel needed or liked in your leadership position? Because that's something that I see in my coaching sessions. So again, these are some more questions you can ask yourself where, there might be some hidden time wasters. There might be some ways that you're showing up as a manager, as a leader that isn't allowing you to develop the team or develop your own resilience. Because if you're a leader, I'm a firm believer that we've got to keep developing our own skills. Another key attribute is assertiveness. So assertiveness is really, really important in terms of and again, it's something I do see a lot within my coaching sessions um, where people feel that being assertive, they feel guilty about it, you know, in terms of being able to set boundaries and be assertive. And I don't know if any of you have ever encountered that. Definitely when it comes to managing upwards. So managing upwards obviously means, um, you know, we were talking about reverse mentoring earlier. Managing upwards definitely means is how do you manage upwards to your, your own leader, your own manager, to ensure that you don't get too overwhelmed, that thing, you know, activities aren't being thrown at you at the last minute. And assertiveness is a key area in business we need to develop in order for us to develop resilience. You know, whether it's a crisis situation, you're going to have to be quite resilient, um, assertive, whether it's you know, you're unable to deal with challenges and problems that come in to the team, then, you know, 
do you need to be a bit more assertive in how you go about leading the team and managing your activities? So I know that many people struggle with this, particularly, as I say, when they're sort of going up the ladder, developing into managers or leaders. So I've given you some phrases here about what you can say. It's not about being rude. It's just about people understanding how you operate. And I've seen it where if you don't, if you don't establish your assertiveness, as I'm sure you've seen, people will sometimes on purpose, sometimes without any awareness, sometimes people will take advantage of that. They'll understand that if they come to you, that you'll probably say yes to something. And I learned that um, the hard way, actually, because I remember, I think it was in the 90s, and I had my first device, which was a uh, Blackberry. I was going to say Blueberry. Blackberry. I don't know if you remember Blackberries. I love my Blackberry and its keyboard. And the first time I got it, I was really excited. It's like, I'm going up in the world. I've got a Blackberry. And I worked for a global, globally for an organisation. And I remember somebody saying to me once, do you know what, Sarah, you're the only person that sent back a message at four in the morning. And we joked about it, but it really made me stop and think. I thought, mm, I'm creating this situation for myself. I'm creating my own fate here. And I was just overloaded. So I couldn't deal with other things that were coming in, you know, through the team. And I suspect that maybe some of you might be dealing with that working from home. I know it's challenging if you don't have a dedicated workspace, but you know, we have to be assertive about managing our time, managing what we can take on. And I realized that, you know, pretty early on in my career and I stopped certain habits because I realized that by being always available, I was creating a rod for my own back. And I learned that, you know, I'm quite assertive in my, my personal life, but, I worked with a CEO who was fantastic. He really taught me about being assertive because I watched him and I modeled his behaviors. He was a great leader. You know, what we, we were talking about earlier, how leaders don't always need to know the answers. And he would say, I don't know. And then he'd ask me, you know, and I was the only female, the youngest person in the boardroom. So I did have to take those mindful moments, those moments of, hmm. And as Laura said before, saying, do you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll come back to you. That's a, le that's a level of confidence and assertiveness. So it's a really important skill set to have. And the more that you develop assertiveness, I feel that this really builds confidence because when I coach people and they're overloaded, their team leaders are unable to deal with what's going on, conflict is built up in the team. Because when you're leading a team, you need to allow time to spend with your team members and if you are a member of a team you need to have you know those moments of self-development so you can start with empathy you can say hmm I see I understand you know good body language you know posture I mean you can clench if you want relating to what Laura said earlier if that makes you feel better but you know there's a really nice power pose actually you can have your hands on your hips a bit as long as it doesn't feel too fake for you but your shoulders back being well dressed all of those things proper posture eye contact and you can use your this is quite a powerful pose here to use I think politicians have used that in the past but you can say you know I know that sometimes you think that but that's not the case and, and it's perfectly acceptable to challenge someone's behavior even if it is your manager, done in the right way. I think it's really important to challenge unacceptable behaviour and decide what's unacceptable. Decide, you know, is that really unacceptable? Because sometimes that can create more and more stressful situations that are going to affect your resilience. So try doing this. Get outside the comfort zone, become more assertive and, and, and tell people what you want. You know, well, I understand that, but I'd appreciate this. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. The more you do it, the more confident that you'll be. And I, I feel that this is really linked to confidence, resilience, having those internal skill sets that we need. Saying no, you know, I, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've coached people that have said to me, I'm completely overwhelmed, I can't do my job. And it's usually not being assertive, being a perfectionist, um, that manager to leader leap, 
and, and they feel like, well, maybe I just can't cope with this. Maybe I'm just not a very resilient person. I'm not cut out for this. And it's like, hang on a minute. Let's look at how you deal with your tasks. Is it urgent? Is it important? As I mentioned before, are you being assertive? Are you challenging practices? And, you know, we're, we're living in a society today that's much more egalitarian, you know, not so paternalistic. So it's highly likely that your team members are going to expect to have a voice. If you are a member of time of a team, find your voice. You know, if you are a leader, encourage your team, you know, encourage them to help shape your vision, your solutions. Say no, say no. You know, I've seen people that are overworked, stressed, and then when something does happen, they can't cope with it because they haven't got the, the mental sort of headspace, really. Stick to your position. You have a right to say yes or no. It's about how you say it. You don't have to be rude, anything like that. But just say, no, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that I can't do that at this point in time. Or you can say, well, if you're asking me to do this, what do, what can I drop in order for me to be able to do this? OK, I know there are emergency circumstances, but we don't want those all the time. Otherwise, you're not going to have the resilience to deal with those situations. So you do have a right to say yes or no, of course, in a professional way. But that really helps people to see that, hang on. This is somebody here that's got their own self-leadership. They've got their own boundaries. Okay, and here's some more tips here in terms of, you know, looking at resilience, looking at resilience. Can you set a resilience goal? Think about, well, what is the change I need to make? When you look back at those situations where you felt overwhelmed, you felt you couldn't cope, you felt that the whole world was against you, you felt trapped in a corner. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a firm believer that we, we can't ignore negative feelings. Um, sometimes I look at feelings or thoughts as information. It depends on the labels we attach to them. We can't avoid those. That's going to happen in life. I'm not a big fan of resisting or suppressing what feels uncomfortable to us because I think it's like trying to push down a beach ball underwater because that beach ball is full of these emotions it's just going to bounce back up and hit you even harder you know it's just going to come back with more force it's like swimming against the tide sometimes so it's important to acknowledge not run away from the fact that you feel a bit overwhelmed that it's like hang on a minute I could be feeling, you know, I could go into victim mode here. I could go into non-problem solving mode here. That's a bit of a red flag for me or an amber flag. So that's not to say that we run away from those situations. It is about taking a deep breath, realizing that that moment's going to pass, taking a step forward, using fear as fuel, and maybe, you know, get into that problem solving solutions mindset that I talked about in the earlier slides. But have a look back through recent situations or past situations. You know, what's the change I want to make in myself? You know, what does make me anxious? Remember, I talked about the stress log earlier. You can do this around anxiety as well. Um, what could I gain by changing my approach when things happen that I'm not expecting and I've not planned for? And how can I make a plan? You know, if you are somebody that's planning, <coughs> excuse me, and processes, OK, when something happens, what's the end point? What are the small steps that I can take towards solving this problem? What are the small steps towards success? How do I recognise success for myself or my team? What support do I need? We don't have all the answers. You know, we need to let go of that thinking of, you know, that we sometimes have, especially if we're leading a team, managing a team, that uh, I need to know everything. Well, you don't. You know, being part, as I said in the chat earlier, a big part of being a leader is being able to say, do you know what, guys? I don't have all the answers. Let's discuss this as a team. Because within your team, if you're working in a team or you've got a scrum team, they're gonna, there are going to be people in there that have got absolutely the right assets, the right tools, the right experience to be able to help you. You know, so um, really think about, you know, making a plan and, and, and looking back on, right, OK, where did I feel less than resilient? What did I change? Where was I anxious? What could I gain or look forward to by thinking about this in a more open way? I could, you know, reduce my stress levels, enjoy work a bit more, engage my team, develop relationships with my team, even if something negative is happening and start making that plan. The other piece to look at is, um, again, 
what is your vision? What are your what, what's your purpose and what are your goals? Now you can actually use this personally. What's your vision and purpose in, in life? But think about it within your career, within your leadership of a team, as a member of a team. And if you're a member of your team and you're not sure what the, the vision, the purpose, the goals are of your team, then maybe suggest, I've done that in the past, suggested to, to your leader, look. Can we have a discussion? Can we all come together about how we deal with situations when we arise? You know, because there's going to be everyone's going to have a different response to dealing with adverse situations where we need to bounce back and have that resilience. People are resilient in different ways. And if you're working as a team, you need to know that. Otherwise, it just gets really, really confusing about who's doing what, who's best placed to deal with a certain situation. Because if there is a crisis or a situation, it may not be the team leader. It may be the, the analytical person. It may be the more directive person who's very like results driven, very fast, very dynamic. And you need to know all of that if you're in a team or leading a team. But you can do this personally. It can apply for your own leadership, you know, because when we're aligned to our vision, our purpose, our goals, then everything else falls away. We stop getting distracted. Therefore, we minimise stress. We minimise pressure. So we need to really understand what our vision, purpose and goals are. Are you aligned or are you, frankly, working on things that are just completely misaligned to what you should be doing? Tenacity, persistence, the ability to bounce back. Again, similar words to resilience. The resilience is that bouncing back. But we do need that tenacity and persistence. And I know from my own experience about having set up now my second business, I've had to have tenacity and persistence in absolute bucket falls because when you're trying to do something different, uh, whether that's as an organisation, individually, as a business owner, stuff's going to happen because you're stretching yourself, you're doing something different. And I didn't realise when I first went into business 10 years ago, I thought, yeah, I just need to be positive, it's fine. And I realised wow, I really need to, tenacity is really key to take those steps forwards. Other pieces that you need to have in play here, health, nutrition, sleep, exercise, maybe supplements, you know, really, really having that foundation, the, your health, how you sleep, etc., is that like the foundation of a house. We don't want some silence, so we need that baseline of exercise, sleep, nutrition. Reasoning, think about how you deal with problems. Do you problem solve? Do you plan? Do you anticipate problems? Do you sort of have a bronze, silver, gold approach to issues or a traffic light system? I'm sure in this industry, there's loads and loads of different examples of how you do this, but it's surprising how many organisations don't plan for what might happen and get a bit stuck when it does arise and everybody's in crisis mode. Who can you collaborate with? Where can you get some help? Are there networks internally? Are there peers? Are there mentors? Are there coaches? Do you have a role model? It could be somebody famous or not famous. If so, what are the traits that you like in that person? And how can you develop that in yourselves? Because sometimes we like and admire people who demonstrate something we'd like to have as a skill, or we have it in us already, we just haven't developed it, so we want to. So have a think about that role models. And then have a think about your composure. You know, how are you regulating your emotions? Remember, we talked about mindfulness moments earlier, taking a break, stepping away from the PC. You know, composure is going to enhance your reputation. The correct composure is going to enhance your reputation. Uh, the incorrect composure could destroy it. It's not to say that we're, we're not all robots. We have moments. If you need to step away, that's fine. You need to understand your profile, how you show up at work to understand, Ooh, actually, when I'm under pressure, I really, really withdraw into myself and I go quiet. So maybe I just need to be mindful of that, that I don't withdraw too much and can come across as aloof. Perhaps under pressure, you're a very directive person and you speed up and you get faster and you can get quite uh, even bossy, you know, and think about, well, hang on a minute, with my colleagues or my team, do I need to watch that? and just temper it a bit, because I don't want to come across as too overbearing, okay? So it's about composure. You know, are we interpreting the situation in the right way? Are we asking the right questions? Are we able to regulate our emotions? Because I'm sure we've all been there. We've all been in that meeting where somebody asks a question and you don't know the answer. How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to compose yourself from a body language perspective? 
How are you going to compose yourself for how you show up, how you dress, how you act? And this is my quote that I made up in terms of, you know, resilience and, and how I see it. You know, we can meditate, we can be mindful, we can be the most positive thinkers in the world, but life is going to throw things at us, as I'm sure you've all seen, be that personally, be that professionally, be that globally, such as we're seeing at the moment. A healthy, open mindset will help you to remain strong and healthy after a setback and learn. So remember what I said about going back through previous events, what was how you were brought up, you know, how you learn, taught to deal with setbacks. Your setbacks don't define, define you. They're an event. They're not you. So if something knocks your confidence, knocks your resilience. That doesn't mean you're not resilient. It doesn't mean you're not tenacious. It doesn't mean you're not confident. It's an event. So don't internalize it and start telling yourself a negative narrative. Your setbacks do not define you. They are events, they will pass, but face them, find solutions, get some help and grow from it. Identify the patterns. And perhaps if you're not having any setbacks in life, if you're not having the opportunity to flex your resilience, the question is, are you challenging yourself enough? So just a quick summary, you know, these are some of the areas that I've covered today, you know, the who, the what, the why of resilience. Is it genetic? Is it learned or it's both? So we need to keep the resilience tank, fuel tank topped up, try different exercises. Um, there is quite a nice exercise around um, open door or closed door. If you want an example of that exercise, I can send that to you. And actually, I've also got um, a PDF book which is called uh, Resilience Hacks. So I've got Resilience Hacks. If you want some Resilience Hacks, some tips, techniques, then get in touch. I've got that and I've got the open or closed door exercise that really helps you to understand what happened in the past. Okay, did I see that as an open door or a closed door? You know, why did I see it as a closed door? Why did I see it as an open door? And if I'd seen it as more of an open door, what could I have learned? So there's a really nice exercise you can just do in a few minutes learning from situations, dealing with change, how to make plans, how to show up at work, how to get help. So it's been an absolute pleasure sharing this information with you today. Um, happy to take any questions if we've got time. Here's my contact details. And um, yeah, over, over to Melissa. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Um, that's really a powerful way to close out our um, two-day um, seminar. Um, as you shared, and you know, just seeing from the chats um, and questions raised, you know, we've all been dealing with a lot during this um, time of the global pandemic. So again, I'll hand over to um, to Roger to help facilitate. Um, there was a lot of chats in the chat box and questions. There are. There's. Uh, um, um, so the first one is: when you become that broken band, and you've had all your resilience smashed out of you. What steps can you take to rebuild? That's from Richard Sefton. Yeah, sorry. So if I heard that correctly, if you really are at a low air, what can you do to build your resilience? Yeah. Yeah. Resilience is a bit like a fuel tank. It's like many emotions. You know, sometimes they're not static. Resilience isn't static. Confidence isn't static. How you feel about your partner, quite frankly, isn't always static. Um, so we need to rebuild the fuel tank. I would start by asking yourself, are you getting enough exercise? Are you eating the right foods? Are you drinking enough water? Are you hanging around with the right people? We don't want energy vampires, especially at the moment. So if you're finding yourself affected by the news, get rid of it. Don't engage with it. Um, if you, sorry, I'm just looking at the comments here. Um, yeah, so I talked about the, the nutrition, the water, exercise, being around positive people. Because studies have shown if we're around happy people, guess what? We're happier. And there's stats all around that. So I'd start with those. Are you around the right people? And identifying which area of your life is it that you think is dropping down your resilience? Is it financial? Is it leadership? Is it career? Is it personal? And really identifying, am I attributing this lack of resilience to one area? And then I would do, um, I would go through the last couple of situations that you've had and think about, right, how could I do that differently? What did I learn? What was going through my mindset? And if you are feeling a bit flat at the moment, then try, um, I don't know whether you 
self-talk is really important. What we tell ourselves is really important because our brain is like a sponge. It doesn't understand the difference between negative and positive. Therefore, whatever we feed our brain, it's going to believe what we tell it. So if we say, do you know what? I'm just not resilient. Your brain will say, okay, you're not resilient. Uh, it doesn't question. So that's why we need to, and we do have as human beings, by the way, a negativity bias. We um, absorb and interpret and internalize negative words more than positive. So we need really, really need to amplify that positive self-talk. And you could say to yourself something like, do you know what? I'm not feeling resilient right now for now. However, I'm gonna take step forwards to build my resilience. So I actually think the mindset is really, really important. So I don't quite know. Maybe you're saying things to yourself that's like, oh, I'm flat out. Maybe it's exhaustion. Um, but feel free, get in touch, book a call with me and we can just run through the specifics of your situation. You can do that via my website. No problem. Thank you. Um, next question. Or well, it's actually two questions, but they're two halves of the same thing from Laura Orcott, who you'll remember from earlier. I'm yeah. Very resilient from a work perspective but struggling more in personal life, how do you bring the skills that you learn through work into personal life to help you? And the other part of that is, any tips for a work-life balance now that most people, or more people are working from home? Yeah. It's very hard to switch off just by walking away from the laptop or whatever, if you find yourself checking emails all evening and first thing in the morning. Um, how do you switch off from work to yeah great questions i could go on forever about all of these but i won't because i'm sure you're all hungry anyway what you could do <laughs> what you could do uh laura with the first situation what can you beg borrow and steal from your work situation that you can apply to your personal situation i don't know what kind of personal situation it is but um if it is um a personal relationship sometimes relationships rather than events can really tap into our vulnerability and trigger us so we need to look at hang on a minute am i reacting am i responding or reacting because sometimes we can get triggered and overreact but is there something that you do in your work environment the way that you compose yourself i'm not saying relationships or business transactions but can you um apply that to your personal situation you know and sort of um gain that emotional regulation if you like is there something you could beg start borrow and steal um so if it's personal you know i don't know again if that's uh, a relationship or or something else but it could be you know communication are you like you do with your team are you communicating effectively with the other people in your life are you asking them questions? Are you getting curious about certain things? Are you asking them things to, to get information? Or are we working under assumptions here in, in the personal life? So <clears throat> there's so many different ways I could go with that. But also, again, you've got to have the foundation of sleep, health, exercise. And we want to be around people that lift us up. You know, we want to be around those people. So that can help build your resilience. But have a look at, you know, what you do in your professional life. And can you attribute that and do that in your personal life? That's what I would say in the time that we've got here. Work-life balance and working from home. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I feel consider myself quite fortunate because I worked for DHL globally like many years ago. So <clears throat> working from home was kind of natural to me back then. But I know a lot, excuse me, my voice is gone. Um, a, load of peop a lot of people are struggling with that. So I would say this is what works for me, okay? I get up in the morning and I dress as though I was going to the office. Now, that doesn't mean a shirt and then jogging bottoms at, uh, on the bottom. If that works for you, great. But I have spoken to a few people that sort of half dress for work. For me, it doesn't work. Whatever works for you. But anyway, dress the part, you know, present yourself in the way that you wish to be seen because you're going to feel better about yourself, which I'm sure all of you do as professionals. Posture, body language. Be present when you're in the meetings. You know, it's very easy on Zoom to sort of go and be looking, looking at your phone, mucking about, you know, doing other things. So we need to like remain focused. Regular breaks, regular breaks. I think sometimes we feel, you know, oh, I'm working at home. My boss can't see me. So maybe he will think he or she will think I'm not working. Therefore, if I, you know, it's almost like work from home. I'm not being seen. I'm not working. We can we can make that kind of leap in our minds. 
And it's like, no, you know, as long as you're confident that you've actually achieved what you want to do during the day, then that's great, you know, and have regular one-to-ones with your boss, understand expectations, take breaks when you need to. And if you have got personal circumstances with family, uh, illness, things like that, then talk to your boss about it because, you know, any good company will respect the balance that you might need. I mean, I've been on Zoom calls with medical directors and they're bouncing their babies on the lap. And it's 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 actually quite endearing and just apologising to say, look, I need to, because I've got to look after my kids. But I would definitely say take breaks, especially when you're looking at videos on screen, you're watching on screen, your brain is actually working really, really hard to concentrate, to look at that video screen all the time. So that might be why you feel drained. Take those breaks, stick to your working hours, only work extra in emergencies. I was coaching a guy the other week and he said, oh, I'm just so drained. And I said, well, tell me what you do. Well, you know, I'm sort of dressed in my shirt and then my jogging bottoms. And then I go to my shed, I do my work. And then I come back out on a Friday at sort of five, half five, finished for the week. And the kids are playing on the computer games um, and I'm bored. I'm bored. So I, I said, well, what do you do then? I go back and do work. Now, to me, I know, get a bit creative. You know, what else can you do with your time? Because staring at a computer sometimes isn't the best way to do it. I mean, I have to just manage even my social life online to not get too drained. But think outside the box. Exercise. Exercise workshops, read a book, you know, use it as an opportunity to spend time with your family, uh, to talk about things, you know, do something different. Just make sure that you're not filling your available time with work because it's too easy to walk back in. You know, I'm in an office here. You can't see it because of the backdrop. I've got an office here. And when I close that door, I close that door, you know. So it's self-discipline, self-discipline. Thank you. Um we were scheduled to finish at 12 30 but i've just been chatting with uh, brenton on this as well brenton phillips um but we're going to go on for another maybe up to 10 15 minutes or so we yeah. will have done by quarter to one for those of you that are hungry um and we can <laughs> and we'll do it but yeah we've still got quite a few questions to get through um the next one was from angela rabs who's asking whether there's any tips for those who work on their own without teams or company bases um there's many health and safety consultants who are one man or one woman bands. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, sorry, was it Angela? I'm not Angela. sure. Is it your business Angela that you Rabs. run on your own? Um, if it's your business that you run on your own, it can be quite isolating sometimes. I hope I've got that right, that it's either your clients um, or yourself that's working by yourself. It can be quite a lonely place sometimes, can't it? Um, and that's where I think working with a mentor or a coach to bounce around ideas can really, really help, you know, and talking with someone that's a trusted peer or colleague. Um, there's um, lots of workshops on resilience that you could sign up to and learn from that. So there's lots of tools out there. And actually, at the moment, during the pandemic, there's lots of different tools and workshops that are being given given away or you know they're quite quite a good price really to sort of help people learn through the pandemic so you know and also you know don't give up on networking you know obviously we want to manage screen time and the sort of brain drain if i can if i can say that but um are there networking events that you can go to because sometimes if you're more of an external thinker or an extrovert joining those networks can help stimulate activities. So I would definitely look at those, you know, look at other people, other people you can work with, collaborate with, um, and then have a look at some of the questions that I've asked you today. Those are things that you could do by yourself um, or work with somebody else, work with, you know, I've got people within my network that we help each other. We don't charge each other anything. I help coach him. And he gives me advice on marketing. So there's things like that you can do. Thank you. Uh, next question was from Nick Thirlby. Do you have any tips on emotional distancing when you might care passionately about a particularly stressful situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is related to emotional management, emotional regulation. I mean, we all have emotions. We all have those situations that will trigger us. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever felt this before, but you, I, 
I don't know, for me, I can sense it. I kind of get a bit of a ink in my chest almost. And that's a sign to me that I need to take a deep breath and think about, right, what's that about me or my past experiences that has triggered that kind of hyper vigilant, that vigilant response? And I go away and start coaching myself on it. Okay, what? Right. I kind of analyze it a bit. What what was that feeling? What was that reaction called? What name can I give it? Where does it come from? What does it remind me of? You know, and I think the you know, we're all going to have those moments. The key is to understand where did that come from? And it could be something that was said to you once as a child, you know, and you you know because when we're kids we're sponges we believe everything people tell us maybe somebody said something to you you know and you internalized it and believed it maybe you've had a past situation that reminds you of that so I would always say it is perfectly acceptable you know and I've done this with with team conflict within teams um my team workshops it's perfectly acceptable to take a time out it's perfectly acceptable if it is a work environment to say, do you know what? I don't think we're going to get to a resolution today. I suggest we come back, we reflect, come back when we're more able to discuss this and get to a win-win situation. That's personally fine. And you, and you can do that on a personal level as well. You know, on a personal level, if it was with somebody um, that you're involved in, in or a personal relationship, you'd say, look, you know, do you know what? I'm feeling a bit hijacked at the moment. I'm feeling a bit triggered. I'd like to have a time out. So we can continue the discussion at another time. But the important thing is to tell the other person, you know, when are you are going to come back and just say, look, I need about an hour or can we talk tomorrow morning? You know, something like that. So you're not le leaving them hanging. So I definitely feel like if you are feeling that yeah, feeling, take that, take the step back. Don't keep going because it will be like a rolling stone that will just get bigger and bigger. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Brenton. Brenton Phillips, and it's around micromanagement. Do you have any tips with how you can deal with the stresses of micromanagement? I'm not sure whether that's the stresses of micro of feeling the need to micromanage people or the stresses you get from feeling that you are being micromanaged. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the number one tip is don't do it. <laughs> so basically, um, and the reason I say that is because there's so much data out there. If you Google, um, you know, why people leave companies, you know, very often it's about the person that's leading them. Do you, know, you know, it's usually in the predominance about the person that's leading or managing them. I know it is in my experience. There's companies where I've just thought, oh, you know, sometimes it's culture as well. Um, and micromanagement is one of the top things. People don't like it. We want to feel that we're capable. We want to feel empowered. OK, the, the tool that I'm going to recommend here is a concept called situational leadership, because if you've got an employee, for example, who's very, very new to the industry and is inexperienced, they're probably going to want a bit of handholding to start with. That's not micromanagement managing. It's sharing your time and your experience with, with them, asking what help they need, developing a training plan. But as people progress, then um, they might want more liberty. So the, the management model you move to is much more of a supervision or coaching model where excuse me, you get more and more hands off because that employee doesn't need that level of management. So you need to, if, it, if you're the manager, understand where you're, the, the, the individual, it's about the individual, where they are on their development journey, their employment journey. Ask them, ask them, how do you want to be managed? How do I get the best from you? Do the disc profiling. It's so important. You can't just take... Um, treat a team as like one sort of entity it's full of individuals and you need to understand how you are how you manage so when you understand it and read the reports when I do this light bulbs are just flashing on all the time now if you are being micromanaged I think looking at some of those assertiveness tips boundaries having an open discussion is really really important because if you don't nip it in the bud it's going to carry on and it may well be um, because let's face it I've, I still feel um that new leaders or even experienced leaders 
um, don't always get the support that they need to understand how to be a flexible leader, how to be a flexible manager. It's not a reflection on you if you have to adapt your style. Sometimes people go at it with a one size fits all sort of paternalistic approach rather than we're in a much more egalitarian, diverse society now and people expect things from work and culture and leadership. So, you know, be open to that feedback. You know, you may not realise it. Think, oh, I didn't realise how that was coming across. And as a leader, that's going to be a great strength of growth. So do bring it up with your leader, because the chances are, if you don't, you're going to leave anyway. And if it doesn't resolve itself and you want to stay, then get some help from HR or, or some a trusted advisor. Yeah, um, the, well, there's time for one more brief question uh, before we hand back to Melissa. Um, this one again is from Nick Thirlby. Do you have any tips on triggering that pause before reacting? instantly yeah absolutely so you can break your state somehow um you can one of the easiest things to do is actually just stop and take a deep breath you know as i don't know if, if you're in a meeting you know that might be all different but i've done it i've just sat there and taken deep breaths so because that allows the oxygen to come into your body and replenish your cells replenish your brain Sometimes when we're stressed, we do very shallow breathing and it's stale air that doesn't feed our body. It doesn't feed our brain. So do that. You could also um, have something in your hand like a pen, as long as you're not looking too fiddly. But, you know, have a pen, you know, pick up, you know, I mean, don't be sitting there texting, I guess, in a meeting. But change your body posture, you know, sit up straight, take a deep breath maybe change your posture to sit back in a way that makes you feel relaxed. It's that whole body mind connection, drink some water. That's a good thing to do. A lot of people use drinking water to take a break, you know, and maybe write some notes, write some notes, do some writing. Cause sometimes that's a good release of energy. So if you're in front of other people, those can be some neat little tricks to avoid that emotional hijacking. Right. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for your questions. Thank you to Sarah for answering them all. I'm now gonna hand back to Melissa Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Roger, and um, thanks, um, Sarah, so much. I, I, this is such an important topic, and you can see it from the questions and, and comments. Actually, I, I saw Ian Wood said, and we get to run back through this presentation. So yeah, <laughs> very important topic. So thank you, Sarah, for um, walking us through um, those tips. So good. So. Um, I'll do a few close out pieces and then I'll hand back over um, to Brenton for the full closure. But, you know, again, thanks very much for everyone um, for the last two days. I think some really good set of um, presentations, discussions and Q and A's. Um, I think kind of summarizing this morning, um, what, what we heard, we heard many things, but, you know, I've highlighted three things here. Or, I, I, you know, the future is really bright um, for the health and safety professional. Um, we have a global presence and impact but it's important for us to get our branding right. Um, you know, I think Laura's um, model of those five levels is a real opportunity and challenge for us um, to allow us to continue to evolve so that we can improve in our impact. And Sarah's piece around professional resilience, really important um, in terms of our effectiveness, mental health and well-being. So I just want to say thanks um, again to the three presenters, David, Laura and Sarah. Thanks, Lam Roger, for facilitating the Q&As. Um, thanks, everyone, for posting their comments and questions to ensure we had have a, we've had an engaging session. Mm -hmm.